Hey, hey, be careful with that. That's the most powerful Trank gun on the market. Huh, got her in Mexico. Cool. Yeah, it is cool. They say it can puncture the skin of a rhino from a hundred... <laughs> Ow! Oh! oh. <clears throat> yes! That's awesome! What? <laughs> that was yes. awesome! Welcome to Flint Dog Woodwork. You know what else is awesome? The five tools I'm going to show you today. These five tools are tools that I'm guessing a lot of you have never seen before. So let's check out these five tools and see if any of them interest you. So as you know, when I do these tool videos, I'm always looking for unique and interesting tools that pique my interest. And I know a lot of you are looking for more project builds, and these will be coming really soon. I'm going to be making a change to the lineup of videos on this channel in the near future. But until then, I'll be putting out one interesting five tool review each week. So the first tool that we're gonna take a look at today is one that I have never seen before. And this thing may give the speed square a run for its money. This tool is especially interesting for those that do a lot of framing or even the weekend warrior that may need to put in a wall. So what is this crazy tool? Well, let's check it out. So this first tool is the Morgan Square. I'm old school. This may look like any ordinary square, but it's got a lot more functions. Let's take a look at it. So if we take a closer look at this square, you can see it has a really unique design. On the very left hand side, it has inches as well as millimeters. At the very bottom, there's the letters CL, which stand for center line. Over on the right hand side, there's a couple of tabs, and if we flip it over, there's also a little lip on the back. So if you're anything like me, you're probably wondering what the heck are all those tabs for? Well, we need to load this bad boy up, so let's do that now. So the first thing that we need to do is take a look at these tabs on the right hand side. If you notice on this side, there's a little area that's jutting up. This is so that you can place your tape measure hook right on top. Once that's in place, you pull out your tape measure and slide it under this hook at the other side. But hey, I saw another tab on there. What the hell is that? Well, that, my friends, is for a good old-fashioned carpenter pencil. It slides right into that slot, and it's very secure so it doesn't fall out. So now that we have this Morgan Square locked and loaded, let me show you how to use it. So first up, I mentioned that lip that's on the very back. This allows you to place it on a piece of wood, and it's fully supported by itself. This slip also allows you to slide it easily back and forth on things like 2x4s. Once you're ready to take a measurement, you simply hook the end of the tape measure on the 2x4 and slide it down. And this is where this tool really shines for framing and layout. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So first off, if we measure the square, it's right at 1.5 inches. And this is the exact thickness of a 2x4. So by striking a line on either side of the square, you can determine exactly where your 2x4 will land. So let's say you need to set up a wall and you need to lay out your wall for 16 on center or even something like 12 on center. That's not a thing! Well, remember that center line marking? With the 16 inches marked right at the center line, you can strike a line on either side of the square and know exactly where your 2x4 will land. So you can just run down the line and strike your markings at 16, 32, and 48. And once you're done, you simply stow away your pencil and then you can move on to the next procedure. Well, this is a pretty cool little tool. I think this thing has a lot of use for carpenters that do a lot of framing. I know I'm gonna use this tool when I frame out these walls behind me. Well, that's gonna cover our first item of the day. Now let's take a look at our second tool, which is based on a design that I know works tremendously well. So I've tried out a lot of countersink bits and there's one bit that works better than all the rest. And that bit is the Amana countersink bit. Now you may have seen this on a lot of other YouTube channels as this bit appears to be very popular. Now by no means is the Amana countersink bit the only bit that you can use. I have a whole drawer filled with different types of countersink bits. But the thing that makes the Amana countersink bit so great is the break on the top. This allows you to not create any damage on the top of your workpiece. So you can just run down the line and create as many countersinks as you want. And you can see that breaking gauge once you get to the bottom. And each one of those countersinks is even and clean. So fresh and so clean, clean. But I do have a problem with this bit, however, and that's if you need to adjust the depth of that countersink, you need to get an Allen key, loosen it up, and adjust the break. 
Either that, or you need to purchase multiple lengths of this bit, and these bits aren't exactly cheap. So when I saw this next tool design, I knew I had to give it a try. So what is this bit, and what makes it so special? Well, let me show you. This tool is the depth adjustment countersink bit, made by Eason. So what makes this countersink bit different than all the rest? Well, it's the ease of adjustability. Let me show you. So if we take a closer look at this bit, you can see it's very similar to the Amana bit. They both have a break on the very top that prevents you from going too far into your wood. Now you probably noticed that the Eason has got a much smaller break, and we'll test this to make sure it works as good as the Amana, but that's not what's so special about this tool. Now if you've ever worked with the Amana bit, you know that you have to get an Allen key and loosen it up to make any adjustment to the depth. And the depth movement is very limited only between these two little notches. But the adjustments with the Eason work in an entirely different way, and it's really quite ingenious. If we look at the top of the tool, you can see there's a little knob. And to adjust the depth, all you need to do is to twist that knob and you can go up and down, creating differences in the depth of cut. And this is because the top of the drill bit, or the threaded portion, has also got drilling capability itself. So you can use this drill bit to countersink to hide that drill head, or you can go a little bit further to put in a dowel. And the adjustability of this bit going from the top setting all the way to the bottom setting is 1.45 inches. So I'm going to go ahead and do three shallow countersinks and then three deeper countersinks and show you the results of this tool. So if we take a closer look at our countersinks, you can see that they came out very crisp and clean. Whether you're doing a shallow countersink or a deep countersink, the results are very good. If we compare this to the Amana tool, you can see that there's basically no difference between the two. And not only were those results amazing, but I was able to make both those cuts with one bit. If I were to do this with the Amana tool, I would have to purchase two bits. So if you're looking for a flexible and adjustable countersink bit that's still cheaper than the Amana bit, this tool might be the one for you. Well, that's two amazing tools that we've taken a look at so far today. Before we move on to our third, I ask you to do me a huge favor, hit that subscribe button, leave a like, and leave a comment. It really does help out this small woodworking channel. Also, if you're interested in any of the tools we take a look at today, I'll leave links in the description below so you can go check out these tools for yourself. Now let's move on to our third item. So this next tool we're gonna to take a look at today is one that caught my eye because it looks so funky, and I wasn't quite sure what it did when I first saw it. And this is a red tool. It's not a pecker tool, but it is a red tool. And this tool could be an excellent tool for you if you do a lot of mortise and tenons or a lot of dados. So what the heck is this thing? Well, let's check it out. So this thing is the woodworking gap gauge. Let's see what's inside this box. So this is the tool itself. You can see on the right hand side, there's a bunch of little teeth. And when this thing is fully shut, it's at 1 8 of an inch. On the very top, there's imperial measurements going from zero all the way up to one and a half inches. At the very bottom, it's millimeters going from zero to 35 millimeters. On the back of the tool, you'll see there's a little knob that allows you to loosen it and tighten it. And this allows you to move it back and forth. So what does this little tool do? Well, as the name implies, it's a gap gauge. Let me show you how it works. So let's take a look at its first of two functions. As you can see here, I have a small dado cut into this piece of wood, and I have no idea how thick this dado is. But by loosening the knob on the top, I can place this tool into the dado. Then I can take the two arms of the tool and separate them so that they reach each side of the dado. Then I'll lock down the top. With the tool locked down, I now can remove the tool and take a look at the measurement. This is 21 millimeters wide or 13 sixteenths of an inch wide. With this measurement, I now know that my stock needs to be that thick in order to fit into this dado. But as I said before, this tool has two features. Let's take a look at that second feature, which is almost the exact opposite of what we just did. So instead of having to figure out how wide our stock needs to be to fit into a dado, what if we need to figure out how wide our dado needs to be to fit our stock? Well, that's when we need to flip this tool around and focus on this gap in the back. We'll loosen the knob and open up the gap. Then we can place our stock into that gap. We'll push on both sides and tighten the knob. 
With our stock firmly gripped and the gap on the back, we can flip our tool around to get the measurement of our stock. And in this case, it's right at one inch. Now that we know the measurement of our stock, we can then go over to the table saw or the router and create the perfect size dado. So this is a pretty cool little tool. I like tools that are simple like this so you don't have to relearn them every time you use them. Well, that's gonna wrap up our third item of the day. Now let's move on to our fourth item, which has an amazing name. So this next tool is an excellent solution for being able to get into those tight spots that you can't really get into with a normal sander. This tool will allow you to sand things like crown molding that has concave, convex, and even little corners that you can't even get into with things like the sand plane. And that's because this tool has almost every imaginable profile that you might need for sanding. So this tool is an 11 piece contour sanding grip made by Ditcock. Ditka? Tell me that didn't have Ditka's name all over mm -hmm. it. Ditcock? So what comes inside the box? Well, let's check it out. So this is what comes in the box. And you can see from these profiles here, the different shapes that you get. You get concave and convex pads, as well as angle pads. It even comes with a nice flexible pad that you can use to get around odd shaped items. Now in order to use one of these sanding pads, all you do is you take a little bit of sandpaper, wrap it around and hold it on the other side. Now these things are quite rigid. I can barely bend this with my hands and judging from the smell of these things, these things are made from the same things as tires, which I think is rubber. While natural rubber is itself a bio-based product since it comes from trees, most tires are produced using synthetic rubber made of petroleum. What? So with your sandpaper locked into place, you can get into all those tight crevices. And you can see how these shapes without their sandpaper really cradle those concave and convex curves. So if you've ever been frustrated trying to squeeze your sandpaper into a tight spot, this might be the tool for you. Well, that's four items down and only one more left to take a look at. This next item you might even be able to take with you on a camping trip. So let's talk about shop cleanliness for a bit. In order to do that, I need to give you a tour of my floors. So believe it or not, before I started woodworking, these floors were completely clean, but now they have paint, stains, and even some epoxy on them. Even my shop furniture, like my router table, are speckled with stain and finish. And that's because I've always been a little bit careless when spraying my projects. I even have a couple of areas that look like a murder occurred. So how could I have prevented all this? Well, I could have taken my workpiece outside and killed all my grass, but to me, that's just not a good solution. And because of this, I Googled deep and I found something that I think might work. So I found a tent. Check that. This is a Weber spray tent. Let's open it up and see what it looks like. Let's pitch a tent. <laughs> so I purchased this tent with two conditions. The first condition is it must be easy enough to assemble where it's not a pain in the butt. The second condition is it must be large enough to fit most of my projects. So let's look and see what's inside that tent case and then assemble it to see how it looks. So inside you get the tent itself along with some of those plastic poles that have the elastic string inside of it. So I'm gonna get to building and we'll see how big this thing is. So after starting to set this tent up, I realized that this is a big guy. So I'm gonna have to set him up outside, which is okay because I usually do most of my painting and spraying outside anyway. So one thing that I forgot to mention is this tent actually comes with stakes, which is nice because just like other tents, this thing can blow away. So first off, let me say that this tent is not too difficult to assemble. It's just like any other tent and it only took me a couple of minutes. If we look at the dimensions of this tent, this thing is about nine feet wide by six foot deep and about five and a half inches tall. One nice thing about this tent is it's got a mesh front. This allows plenty of airflow once you're done finishing your tent. And the mesh front attaches with Velcro all along the front. When you're not using the mesh, you can simply roll it up just like with many other tents and tie it up with these little knobs on the front. On the back side of the tent, you'll also find a little hole where you can run your electrical or the tubing for your sprayers. This is also a tactical Velcro and can be rolled up with those same little knobs. 
So I'm pretty impressed with this tent. For reference, I'm six foot one and I can easily get in here with a sprayer or anything else I may need. I also really like the mesh front so that you can seal it up so that things like bugs can't get in once you're done spraying. Well, that's going to do us for today, folks. I really appreciate you joining me and checking out these five tools and accessories. If you haven't already, make sure you hit that subscribe button, leave a like, and leave a comment. It really does help out this small woodworking channel. Until next time, take care as always.